Hello. Uh, this is the fourth and final part of my lecture on mental testing in the United States. It covers four motifs. The critique of testing, the continued use of tests, and the development of improved tests, uh, continued evidence for the reality of intelligence differences, and the development of more sophisticated conceptions of intelligence. As with the other videos in this section, uh, our textbook is Morton Hunt's A Story of Psychology, and I will follow Hunt's arrangement of the material quite closely. From 1921 onwards, when Yerkes edited a massive report on the findings of the Army testing program, intelligence testing came under attack by advocates for the underprivileged. These charged that testing measured acquired knowledge and cultural values rather than innate intelligence, and hence was biased in favor of the dominant white middle class and against the lower class and immigrants. To critics, there were numerous examples of test questions which reflected the knowledge and attitudes of the middle class. Thus, for example, at a time when most Americans could not afford to buy a motor car, the Army Alpha Test asked testees to identify the names of certain motor cars. Similarly, the Army Beta Test, intended for men who were functionally illiterate, included a complete the picture question, requiring them to add a net to a picture of a tennis court, a game which at that time was closely linked to elite social status and with which most immigrants and manual laborers would not have been familiar. Even the more sophisticated Stanford Binet test assumed middle class values when it asked for correct definitions of concepts like justice or required eight-year-olds to say what they would do if they had broken something which belonged to someone else. Again, unlike Binet, who left open the extent to which his tests reflected heredity and experience, the proponents of mental testing in the United States were both strongly hereditarian in their views and believed that differences in intelligence were strongly linked to ethnicity with African Americans and Hispanic Americans being widely assumed by the proponents to be less intelligent than white Americans, and similarly Southern Europeans and the Slavs of Eastern Europe being regarded as less intelligent than Northern and Western Europeans. In 1922, the respected columnist and pundit Walter Lippmann launched a critical attack in the New Republic on those such as Terman and Yerkes who claimed that testing measured innate mental ability. Rather, said Lippmann, it served the purposes of the prejudiced and the powerful. It also stamped a permanent label of inferiority on children, especially the underprivileged. This view was later echoed by Stephen Jay Gould in his controversial but influential 1981 study, The Mismeasure of Man. Although accused by his opponents of exaggerating or even misrepresenting his case in order to advance a leftist agenda, Gold convinced many readers that early 20th century mental testing had lent power to xenophobic, racist, and elitist elements in American society who had feared both African Americans and new European migrants as a threat to the ethnic purity of their own stock. I do not have time here to describe this complex and emotion-laden debate, but I will note in passing that the acrimony surrounding Gold's book was itself an indication of how politicized the debate had become. Meanwhile, perhaps linked to the original critique by Lippmann and others, intelligence testing had begun to lose favor amongst professional psychologists during the 1930s a trend which increased in the 1940s by when the belief in a single general intelligence was also being questioned. Finally, in the 1960s, a protracted virtual IQ war got underway, with many increasingly influential advocates linked to the civil rights movement arguing that mental testing discriminated against minority groups. These advocates succeeded in getting boards of education in several cities to stop IQ testing in public schools. 
political pressure on state legislatures continued to try to stop testing, and by the 1990s laws had been passed in many jurisdictions which forbade giving standardized intelligence tests and academic aptitude tests to minority black and Hispanic children who had scholastic problems, California most prominently. Moreover, in some schools, administrators avoided testing in response to parents' wishes, even though not legally obliged to do so. Thus, nationally, between one-third and one-half of all public school districts did not administer group intelligence or aptitude tests. And even of those that did, many made little use or no use at all of the results in tailoring programs to students' abilities. Despite these developments, testing and mental abilities continued, however, albeit not always under the name of intelligence tests. Testing of differences had simply proved itself too useful to college admission officers and human resource departments of many businesses to be discontinued. The SAT provides a good example of this. Originally called the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT originated in 1926 as a means of evaluating applicants to American universities and colleges. It has continued to be widely used up to now because of its perceived value to college administrators. This despite objections that have been raised about its fairness and the abandonment of its original name in response to those who were suspicious of its status as an intelligence test. As early as 1958, to meet criticisms of existing intelligence tests, the psychologist David Weschler developed two new ones, the Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children and the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale. These each have two major parts. One, verbal, covering vocabulary and comprehension, and secondly, performance, with nonverbal tests, such as arranging pictures in an order that tells a story or spotting a missing element in a picture. These tests came to be widely praised and were seen as avoiding the problems associated with the earlier tests. Later revised, they continue to be widely used. Importantly, they predict school performance rather well as well as indicating which children should be given special attention or be enrolled in enrichment programs, as per Binet's original view of the purpose of his own tests. Since its original conception, the Stanford Binet test has also been modified to better test the abilities of test takers from diverse cultural backgrounds. Support for the reality of intelligence and hence of the value of intelligence testing, has continued to come from twin studies, first identified as a crucial source of data by Francis Galton in the 19th century. More statistically sophisticated now than they were in the past, modern twin studies comparing fraternal and identical twins, especially of those identical twins raised apart, still support the view that genetic inheritance plays a major role in determining mental abilities so that intelligence testing does indeed test innate ability as well as acquired knowledge, with half of the variation in IQ scores commonly being reckoned to be due to genetic factors. There is also now evidence from brain scans for differences in the development of the cortex between children of different intelligence levels as measured by IQ tests. According to these studies, the cortex the sheet of neurons covering the brain, which deals with many higher-order brain functions, grows to be thicker than average in the case of more intelligent children, and then thins out, suggesting that fruitful neuronal links being formed and then redundant ones being pruned out. There have also been changes in the conception of intelligence, leading to the development of a more complex and nuanced portrayal of what it is. The early mental testing movement in the United States was reinforced by the concept of general intelligence, or G, pioneered by the English psychologist and statistician Charles Spearman in 1904 and supported by extensive further research. Using factor analysis, a statistical technique which he first developed, Spearman identified strong correlations between different measures of ability among schoolchildren. That is, those who did well in one subject 
such as English comprehension, also did well in their other school subjects. It was therefore argued that test scores reflected an innate core of intelligence rather than just separate mental abilities. If there was an underlying G it was held, then even those specific mental abilities might rely partly on learning. The overall level was innate. By the 1940s, however, new statistical studies had found clusters of particular correlations amongst traits of intelligence, casting doubt on the value of Simeon's G, and later leading to an increasingly common view that there were several different kinds of intelligence rather than a single general intelligence. No consensus has yet emerged as to what these different intelligences are, however, at the present time, the two most popular models are those proposed by Howard Gardner of Harvard and Robert Sternberg of Yale. Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences was outlined in 1983 and offered persuasive evidence for eight different intelligences, some of which are promoted in Western societies and others not. These different intelligences are as follows. Logical mathematical, linguistic, naturalistic, musical, spatial, kinesthetic, interpersonal, and intrapersonal. Someone may be gifted in one or more of these areas, but average or deficient in others. For example, be linguistically gifted, but poor in musical ability and understanding. For his part, Sternberg's approach, described in a succession of influential publications since the 1980s, has included a fundamental distinction between three rather different types of intelligence, namely analytical intelligence, as in the successful understanding and analysis of problems, creative intelligence, the ability to respond creatively to new and challenging problems, and practical intelligence, used in the management of everyday affairs. As important as better tests and a broader understanding of what intelligence is has come a general acknowledgement by psychologists that both genetic and environmental factors are important in the development of an individual's intelligence. The extreme hereditarian views that were common in the early 20th century are now very rare. In conclusion, we may note that despite continued opposition to IQ testing, it remains one of psychology's most persistent and widely used inventions. However, a clear understanding of the validity and value of mental testing has come to be clouded by political controversy and emotion. The development of more sophisticated understandings of intelligence and of more rigorous testing methods has proved an important response to earlier objections to the testing project. This said, the field still remains controversial. Thank you.